Okay, we're gonna go live now. All right. Okay, so we're just waiting for some partic participants to join us. And something, oh, um, and quick question, even though we're live and as we wait for people to join, are you both still in quarantine? <laughs> So last time we spoke. I'm not. I, I got out of quarantine two days ago, so I feel very free right now. Congratulations. Yes. Thank you. I've made it out of my fifth quarantine. <laughs> I think I as well. Yeah, I actually even extended my trip to Montreal so I can have a bit of a, of a normal life for a few weeks. I, um, I feel like Hallmark should have a new card that's like, congratulations, you're out of quarantine. And, <laughs> you know, some, maybe they're missing a market there. I think that's the next dating app is quarantine dating. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. Okay, so we have about a hundred people with us, so I'm gonna kick everything off. So, firstly, um, hello, I am Tani. If you've been with us throughout the week, you may also know me as the magic behind the scenes. Today, I'll be joining you on screen. Hi, um, I've been working with Pinch Social for about three years now, producing Social Media Week, and I can't lie, it's a little sad not to be in the theatre, but I'm also just so happy to at least be here with you all virtually this afternoon. And thank you to everyone who's been a part of Social Media Week um, this week and over the past years. Um, a little icebreaker, I'm just wondering with a raise of hands, how many people have been a part of Social Media Week already this week? Perfect. And now, if you'd like to raise your hand if you um, are joining us for the second time this week. And finally, please raise your hand if you've been here all week with us. Amazing. So today um, is our last session of the week, but most certainly not least. Today we've been discussing, today we'll be discussing how to build real connection and community into your marketing and PR strategy with Amber Ray Cruz, Marketing Director at Meltwater, and Michelle Barmash, Head of Global Communications at Macage. Before I get into introductions, here's a little bit of housekeeping. Please use chat to get to know each other, network, and add your comments, thoughts, and ideas. To ask our panelists a question, please put those in the Q&A found at the bottom of your screen. Um, may also ask you, a couple of you to ask your questions live on camera. So um, we'll send you a little message before just to make sure you're comfortable with that. Now on to interrupt introductions. Amber Ray Cruz is the marketing director at Meltwater Water Americas, as I mentioned. As the head of marketing at Meltwater Americas, Amber Ray Cruz is responsible for applying an integrated marketing approach to drive customer loyalty, industry leadership, and organizational growth. She's passionate about all things that fall into that sweet spot, which intersects compelling content, digital strategy, and customer experience. Amber Ray has built her career in both North America and Asia Pacific which has strengthened her ability to understand various markets. Now, Michelle Boromash, wow, wait until you hear this bio, guys, like some of the name drops, wow. So Michelle started her career in Montreal at L'Oreal, then moved to the agency side where she worked at Citizen Relations. She has worked with brands in several categories, including Sephora, Labai, um, Michael Kors, Procter & Gamble, Cal, and if you're not aware, um, they are responsible for John Frieda, Bjor, and Jurgens. Ethan Allen, General Mills, and Bacardi. She also activated at pre prestigious events such as the Emmy Awards, the Sundance Film Festival, the Golden Globes, and TIFF. Um, in 2013, she became Reebok's Global Head of Public Relations, where she managed many global product launches and partnerships around the world, working alongside celebrities light, like, wait for this, Gigi Hadid, Miranda Kerr, Kendrick Lamar, Future, Ruby Rose, Lena Dunham, Zoe Kravitz, Conor McGregor, Rhonda Rosie, um, Shaquille O'Neal, and Victoria Beckham. She has recently taken on the role as global communications at Nakaj, 
overseeing PR, social media, influencer relations and collaborations. Now, Michelle, if you ever want to invite me to dinner with Zoe Kravitz, Victoria Beckham and Shaquille O'Neal, I would not turn down your offer. Done. Um, <laughs> maybe I'm going. They're great ladies. <laughs> yeah, very big fan. <laughs> um, and then, uh, not to further ado, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what the session's about, and then I'll pass it over to Amber Rain. So today, we're going to talk about um, everything that's kind of happened in this past year with COVID-19, PR and communications. So what 2020 has taught us is that every marketer and PR professional needs to be able to think on their feet. Budgets are not secure, marketing channels are in flux, and we are forced to rethink the way we engage consumers. When COVID-19 arrived, Michelle was quick to rethink her strategy, despite the uncertainty Today with Amber Ray, Michelle will speak on how she turned challenges into possibilities and made building trust and connection with customers a priority. So Amber Ray, I'm gonna pop off the screen and let you guys start your discussion. Amazing, thank you so much, Tani. I'm, I'm still taking a moment to get over that, that resume, it's incredible. Um, <laughs> well, thank you so much, Social Media Week, for having us. We're so excited to be here. Um, you know, when Tani and uh, the rest of the team at Social Media Week reached out to us, uh, it was just natural and very obvious for us to want to reach out to Michelle. You know, over this year, it's been so challenging for marketers um, to just sort out, you know, what, what does today mean? It's such a new reality that we're all working in. And we've really admired at Meltwater the way that Michelle has really led Makaj through this year. Um, so thank you so much, Michelle, for joining us. We're so excited to have this moment to you know, just teach, teach a lot of the, um, the attendees here, you know, how, how you did it all. So, but before we get started, we wanted to ask a, a really quick question to the audience and we had a poll. Uh, so the poll, it's gonna pop up on your screen now. So how many of you shifted your, your PR and marketing strategies during COVID? Uh, the first one just being yes, and the last one just being no. So we'd be, I'd, I'd love to hear um, what that what that percentage is. All right. Well, let's get started, Michelle. Um, you know, I think maybe probably the best place to to start would be to just you know kind of ask you a little bit about this career path of yours. We just heard about your resume, crazy impressive. Um, can you tell a little? Can you tell us a little bit about like what brought you to Macaj? Yeah, I'd be happy to. First of all, thanks for having me. Um, I'm really happy we're able to do this and hi to everybody virtually. It feels unusual to stare at my computer in my kitchen. Um, yeah, I, I, do you know what I say always too is that uh, it's okay to not have a really clear path. Um, I'm from Montreal, I'm French Canadian, but actually did a lot of my education in the States, in fact, all of it. And I had this path when I was in university as to what I thought I would do. And frankly, at first that was education and I thought I'd coach. And uh, before I knew it, I took a leap of faith and ended up in this world of comms. At first, it was just PR, because that's where it was. That's where it started. Um, and then, yeah, like it was mentioned earlier, I went in-house to agency, which is not often half, you know, the, the trend, um, and uh, which a number of jumps along the way landed me at Reebok, and I was there for quite some time. Um, really fortunate for the work that I was able to do there and build the connections that I did but I traveled a lot, <laughs> a lot. And it wore on me after some time. And um, I decided to kind of, well, not kind of, I decided to launch a consultancy business at that time. Um, and while working with many clients, uh, predominantly in Los Angeles at the time, this was last year, um, I got back in touch with Elisa Dehan, who's one of our co-creative chief officers um, at Macaj. And uh, I mean, Macaj, I don't know about everyone on this, most are Canadian. I mean, Macaj is a brand that I grew up with. In fact, my first real gift from my husband was a Macaj coat in 2008. I mean, um, I have a lot of love for that brand. I, I, I believe in the product. And Elisa reached out because we were, or the brand at the time, was going to open its flagship in New York City in uh, July of this year. And it asked if I would take on the project. And I was really excited about it. So I took it on. And that evolved into, in January, overseeing 
at, as a consultant, um, the PR and uh, influence marketing functions at that time. And then COVID hit. <laughs> and then it was, you know, like we actually would love for you to oversee a number of different functions. So they rolled in collaborations and social. And I hopped on this crazy train. And um, I love the brand, I love the product, but honestly, I love the team. Um, I'm hoping my team's listening because uh, I think they know how much love I have for them. But Amy in particular, who will get a personal shout out, she and I, we were two peas in a pod. You know, when I started, we had an agency partner, we had a bigger team, and then before I knew it, we unfortunately downsized. Um, but we made it work. And uh, so yeah, so technically I've been a part of the Macaz team since April, formally. Officially. Amazing. Yeah. We're actually, I have a couple requests to speak louder. Oh, um, so I, I think everybody's trying to hang on your words. <laughs> so. I don't speak louder. <laughs> no Cool. So could you maybe, I mean, you know, your, your job sounds so incredible. Could, could you give us just a, a walkthrough of what a typical day to day is like for you? Ooh. That's such a cliche thing. Am I loud enough now? I'm like, I feel like I'm talking. Yeah. I think okay. so. Can yeah. we get a thumbs yeah. up from the <laughs> Better? Okay. Sounds like it. Um, no typical day. I <clears throat> admittedly don't sleep a whole lot. Um, I have an Apple watch now that's giving me that really horrible news. Um, I mean, I train a lot. I work out and then the day kicks off really early. That habit started at Reebok because I had an agency partner I had agency partners around the world. So I'm up very early working at 5.30. Um, I would say it's pretty standard here even because we still have a team in London. Um, the day is connecting with my team this way all day long. Um, so obviously in the morning, I have a check-in with my, my own team. We make sure we're good for the day. Priorities are straight because I'm sure everyone on this call can imagine that no matter how straight your strategy is, especially in this time, it's constantly pivoting. Um, we're famous for fire drills. So every morning we just have to adapt to what the day has given us, whether that's, you know, product related, new cycle related, something on social. So every morning we're connecting to make sure we're aligned with that. And then a lot of calls, a lot of partner calls, um, you know, a lot of media calls because the big shift we'd had when I started was we did have an agency partner who we were really reliant on for media relations. And uh, the second that ended, thankfully, I've done a lot of media relations in my career. So we now picked up the phones and started getting back in touch with people and making sure that my cash was on their radar. Um, and uh, we admittedly paused media relations for quite some time. And I'd be curious to know if everyone else felt the same, especially in the heat of everything. Um, but we're now picking back up that that side of things so there's no typical day and I love that that's what I love the most I I absolutely love it and so you you'd mentioned obviously there are some changes with media relations could you maybe speak to some of the main differences um in terms of your social media marketing strategy at Macash from like pre-covid to post-covid yeah um well, I, I can't speak, I can speak to pre from, you know, obviously my conversations with the team, but admittedly the, the strategy for social was very content heavy and not social first content heavy. Um, the product uh, is spectacular. They've done some really beautiful and created some beautiful content that would sit on social. And fundamentally we spoke to our community through product. And the second that COVID hit, it was very clear to us that we had to dig deeper and connect to our community, not like about all things aside from product, frankly. Um, so that was the, at the heart of everything that we, we did the second that this um, pandemic hit, which was dig into uh, the brand and, and start showing its soul and who we were about and what mattered to it. And specifically what mattered to our co-creative chief officers who are um, Aran Alpassi and Elisa Dahan. So what defines them? What defines what they care about? How do they con con you know, connect to the community of Montreal? And at large, they love New York. And so let's try and dissect some of these things. Um, and then also let's talk about how they're, you know, we, the train didn't stop. We had to create product for future seasons, but you know, from our home. So how did they get inspired? How were we inspired during COVID? So we, um, 
we were trying, we tried to show a bit of that the second that this hit, you know, we regrouped and we went, okay, let's, let's get in there and see how we can make sure our community knows us a bit more, less about the product, but more about who we are as a brand. And was that an easy pivot? I mean, number one, I would love to just hear if we could dig in a little bit about what that actual process was. Like how, how did you bring the team together? Maybe even just like some real tangible steps of how do you make that pivot? And I'm also curious, like, was it easy? Like, what does it take to be able to pivot like that? Oh, um, so I think I said this to you and I, everyone needs to take this with a grain of salt, but what the functions in my teams do in moments like this, when paid media in particular is stripped, you have to think very quickly and you have to be super nimble. And I think the moment that we realized, oh, wow, this is, this is a thing that's going to happen. It's going to have severe impact on everybody. Um, one morning on a call, it was, okay, what are five things that we think we can do right now really quickly? And it was as simple as that. And then the following day was pitched and the team got really excited about a couple. And then we went, it was that quick. Um, and I'm really proud of that because we did adapt very quickly. And I ran Elisa talk about that a lot outside of just what we do, but from a design perspective and a sales perspective and sell-in and virtual sell-ins and all this type of stuff. Um, we moved very quickly. Um, Process-wise, <laughs> there wasn't much of one. It, if anyone knows me, they know that I'll have this idea and then I've basically moved 15 steps ahead of everyone before it's kind of settled. And I, I think that that's the beat we've been running at. And um, it's, it's, it's been really, it's been fruitful. We've been really happy with what we've been able to do. So a, a lot of the things that it sounds like you guys have done have, has, have centered around this authenticity. Can you speak a little bit more to that? And, and maybe also just, just talk about how, what, what social media's role was, was in that and, um, and maybe how you guys were able to make those authentic connections through those platforms or processes? Yeah, I, I, if, it, if, I'm, if I'm thinking back on it now, it wasn't overly orchestrated. It just felt like we wanna talk to our community specifically on our platform that um, we lean into the most, which is Instagram. I mean, we're a fashion brand, so it makes sense for us to be there. And we developed um, two programs off the bat. One was called Mondays with My Cash. Um, and the intention there was to connect with our larger network and um, invite people that inspire us at a weekly chat with Iran and Elisa. And the intention there was to be very, very specific with uh, the interest that that person liked, or sorry, ex expert, like was an expert in, and making sure that our community would feel like they're learning something and being inspired by that thing. And um, that was something that maintained an eight week cycle. <laughs> it was a hustle, but it was really fantastic because we were able to connect with people. First of all, there, it was borderless. So we went on Insta Live and we hopped on and um, we were able to really get tangible comments from our community. And I know everyone was on a live at some point during COVID, but we uh, definitely maintained that kind of programming. And it was also a way for us to think 360 in a world in absence of paid. So newsletter, earned, social, all of these things connected. Um, and then we reached out to a larger community actually via DM um, to a lot of people that were just inspiring us or we saw we're doing some good in the world and we just had extended an offer to support and help in some way, shape or form. So those are the two things that we basically turned on very, very quickly. And um, I, I know we're gonna get to this later, but the, the challenge with that was that there was no proper way to assess success um, because the, you know, no one really understood what a high count would be on an IG Live. In fact, when we first launched these, I'm sure everyone remembers, but you couldn't actually save these. They lasted for 24 hours and then poof off they went. And, um... <laughs> Hi, Pete. <laughs> Turn your camera off. Oh. <laughs> so, literally one of my best friends, which is very funny to be fun right now. <laughs> The fact that that happened to him is pretty funny. Um, so 
So yeah, so we had no clue on how to specifically track success. Um, so everyone at the end of one would go, well, we only got 120 people on, was that good? Did that drive sales was actually a question that was asked at first. Um, the answer we all knew it was no, because that wasn't what the purpose was uh, of it was. But um, now, thankfully, Alive stays on IG and we can actually track the views post. So now it feels as though it's a little more tangible from a Cape Guy perspective. But even then, back, you know, if I think back months, months ago, we had no clue what, what felt good. Aside from it just felt right, I think. Um, yeah, and then on the DM connect and care part is what we were calling it internally. We had a really strong um, response rate, which we were really, really happy about. And what we realized is because it wasn't about traditional influencer marketing where you're reaching out to someone and asking for them to wear your product. In fact, none of that was ever discussed, not for a second. We didn't do that for months, months and months. And probably it, we only really started doing that again in September. Um, and people were just genuinely touched that we reached out. Um, so that's where on the influencer marketing front and the community piece, I think that's the shift we're gonna see more than ever. And I keep telling my team that product, if you know our brand, you know we have really beautiful things and we're more than happy to be generous and support in whichever way we can, but people wanna care and wanna really wanna connect with people now more than ever. And we are right behind that. So whichever way we can, let's let's find a way to to amplify um, the fact that we really care and we want to connect to our community and um, future community members um, as much as possible. I would love to kind of sit here for a moment because I think there's you know one of the challenges that certainly I face and and my team faces and our customers face is you know proving the ROI you know proving that your efforts are really contributing to the bottom line. And, you know, it, it's so interesting to hear you talk about how, you know, maybe initially your focuses were much more product forward. And then you made this pivot to something maybe a little bit like softer, but a different approach where you're building community, these types of things. How do you convince your C-suite that that is the right change when it's really difficult to prove that success, as you said? I think, uh... Frankly, there wasn't a lot of convincing needed. I might be lucky. I think I will assume that a lot of marketers on this call felt the same way. When things like got bad, at least my instinct and everyone that I worked with was, I don't, we should not be pushing product. We sh Obviously we care about sales, don't get me wrong. Like I'm sure if, you know, Iran, Elisa or Marianne might see more on the call that I don't, don't wanna, you know, give up fa a false impression. However, what we were doing had nothing to do with that. As we progressed and we realized that we were really leaning into a community that was responsive, at the tail end, we started merging commerce with what we were doing, but only at the tail end. Um, and it comes back to that was not, the objective was never to, to, to drive sales with these specific initiatives. We definitely had other meetings about tactics that we would hopefully be able to get off the ground that had far more to do with, you know, driving and converting. But as far as what we were doing, it was really just about connecting. Um, so I guess in retrospect, I feel quite lucky that I didn't have to, you know, run through the gamut as to why we should be doing this and why we shouldn't be doing any kind of traditional influencer marketing or, yeah. Um, I, we genuinely did not pitch a story if Ames was on, she can chat. I think, um, I think for four months, we I, like not a pitch was out. There were a lot of calls. We were talking to people. We were talking to friends of our brand who would bring on for Mondays with my cash, but never got a call from anyone in my C-suite saying, Mish, like you gotta figure out a way to drive or push this product. Not on my team, but for some others, for sure. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because actually you know, generally speaking, you know, the question was really about like, how do you prove that ROI? Right. But it, it was interesting to watch, you know, a lot of brands like know that this is a different time. This is yeah. a different situation. And there, there was a lot of kind of redirects and um, 
I think just a lot of like reflection for brands. I, I just realized that I've been doing a terrible job at managing the chat. Tawny, I'm so sorry. She's been pinging me that there's all these questions and I was not watching it. So Tawny, I'm going to throw it to you to uh, bubble up one of these questions for Michelle. Yeah, no problem at all. So we have a couple of good questions. Um, yeah. One of them kind of takes it back to authenticity. Um, and this is from an anonymous attendee and it's at Reeves. Everyone talks about authenticity, but I feel like nobody knows what it really means. Can you give us an example of what it looks like when a brand is not being authentic? For, ex for example, what not to do? Great question. Oh, um, I won't name a brand obviously, but I think if any, well, there were some brands that were blown up through um, COVID that were still paying a lot of influencers to wear products. That's the first thing that comes to mind. I saw that and frankly didn't get it. Um, that's like, I use this example often because again, I, I did a lot of collaborations prior to and that's obviously what I do a, a part of my job at my cash is anything where it feels like you're just cutting a check for some sort of like um, consumer facing moment truly to me gives me the heebie-jeebies. And we got really deep into that world. I think this, this entire, like this entire, um, pandemic definitely shown a light, like was shining a light on the fact that a lot of that we just got out of hand, especially in the world of fashion. Um, and I think that for a lot of reasons, brands were continuing down that path through the summer. And then um, my hope is that people recognize that that's not the way we should be moving forward. I surely don't believe in it. And when so you say that comes to mind. And would you say that you could pinpoint that? Do you think everybody else could see that blatantly? Or is it because- Oh, I know, I, mean, I work in that industry. I ask myself that question all the time. Um, consumers are smart. I think they're smart. I think they're definitely, I think that what happens with, where influencer marketing really shines is when you've developed a relationship personally with an influencer. Like I like who you stand for and therefore there's a level of trust. Brands who develop that same level of relationship with those types of people, to me, is what becomes, you know, a success. One off for me is hard to justify. Um, so, yeah, I don't, but I don't know the answer, Tani, to be honest, because I'd hope so. But also, I know that we've all got caught in that trap, too. So, um, yeah, I think over time, it'll be more obvious. I do. Yeah, and people are becoming more aware of it, like you said. Precisely. And then we have a question from Jason. Jason didn't want to join us on video today, so I'll be Jason right now. How were you able to convince leadership to run an Instagram Live engagement campaign without quarantine targets and no benchmark? If there were 100 people who watched the Instagram Live video, do you track them all the way through to see if they convert? Ah, good question. That gentleman that hopped on the line before does a lot of lives too. Um, whatever you want to watch, PJ style. Um, so I don't know why it wasn't hard to convince at the beginning, and it wasn't very sophisticated, if I'm being honest, because we didn't track at first. You know, like the first one we had, I remember we were really excited as a team and um, not a whole lot of people knew how to hop on a live, right? Like, I don't, this is, this is March, uh, April. So just hopping on was a success. Just like having a full fledged hour long or 59 minute conversation felt like a success. Hitting, we benchmarked, I think at 35 people, you know, and we have 145,000 people that follow us. We just had no clue. We were basically assessing how other lives were going on at the time and based off of the guests that we had and that's, that's what it was. I still haven't cracked how you can track conversion. The only way that we've seen success from a conversion perspective is what I was saying to Ember at the top, which was at the tail end, we merged commerce with our my, monies with my cash. But the first one we did had a nonprofit, like a, a very nice charitable component to it. So we do believe that there's a little bit of that. So we, um, in fact, at our first IG live, um, our community asked for us to make masks, like literally the first one. And if you think back on 
like first week of April, no one really was behind the mask thing. It felt mm -hmm. a little crazy. And we saw this pop up and all of us were like, oh my gosh, maybe we should be creating masks. Long story short, we ended up doing that. And the first masks we made were made in Canada and a portion of those proceeds went to Centraide, United Way. Yeah. And they smoked. They like we sold them and they were gone. And then we basically, as Iran would say, we were like a bakery. We'd sell them as we'd make them because they were made in our sample room. And uh, in fact, get yours because they're amazing. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so that's really, that's the one and conversion one-to-one, -one, I couldn't tell you because the IG live at its peak had 130 people mm -hmm. and we sold out through a lot more than 130 masks. So yeah, but the click rate though, I would say Tani on our newsletters was very high. That oh. is something that we were really, really excited about as we kept going, depending on the guest our click rate was really, really um, increasing. It was, in it, it ended up plateauing, but it was still a really solid number. We were proud of. So it sounds like it's very similar to any kind of organic marketing. You, you just kind of see what the cause and effect is and you try and see what it, what it was the cause and what the outcome was. Basically, and I think that's been part, you know, the amount, it did take a lot of effort um, to pull off, you know, the team, we, we built a, a site like a, a landing page for each my cash every Monday there's obviously working with the partner because we had some celebrity partners that hopped on as well and making sure Ryan and Elisa had their script and like there was a lot of coordination um I felt like a producer <laughs> for eight weeks um and with that in mind we've been questioning whether or not it's something we would continue just because of not being able to track that ROI now now knowing that we you know we're able to turn on other functions a bit more than we had been in the in the heart of the summer. Um, we're not sure if that's the direction we want to continue, but there's still a lot of love for it. It felt like we came together as a team too. I think there was a lot of that. You know, we just like got excited um, to get these off the ground. Amazing. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pop off. I'm gonna stop hijacking your conversation and we press on. And Tani, I will do a better job of watching this, this chat. So feel free to ping through more questions as, as they come. Michelle, I love the, the kind of the, the hustle that it sounds like you and your team are able to, to just rally around. I find that sometimes with marketing and marketers, we, we almost get like wrapped up in objectives and making sure that all of the pieces are perfectly at play and, you know, before we, we act on anything. And, and that can obviously just create a lot of drag in the ways that you're able to action um, different campaigns. Um, can, can you maybe speak a little bit more to, I just find it very refreshing that you're like, we didn't really know what we were doing. So how do you, when there is a new platform that pops up, how do you make the decision to actually uh, use that for Macaj? What is the kind of decision making behind knowing that this is something that you want to experiment with tomorrow? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so don't, don't let me mislead you. I love data. You know this about me. Um, and Rachel on your team knows this infinitely. I'm a very data-driven person. So it was a little odd to step away from that for this program, if I'm honest, especially now as we move forward and we're really, I have a new team member specifically. And I, I, I'd say the team is probably what makes all these things shine. And I've said this at the beginning, but I can't Say enough about the team that I have and how we came together to get this stuff done and everyone was looking at numbers but just not being able to assess success so it just felt right so we kept going and um, I think that that's 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 what was really interesting if I again you know look back on how we, we pulled that off um, now the channel thing is interesting for us I'm a firm believer of not jumping around until you've really done one very, very well. And we haven't done Instagram really well yet. Um, we're really only leaning into the proper tools that's gonna, that are gonna help us grow for one, because we've been blind to a lot of things. We haven't had the right analytics to really guide us through that, especially in absence of paid right now. So this is all organic. Um, and then, there is admittedly pressure always to jump on other platforms, especially for a fashion brand when the likes of TikTok have taken off. 
uh, the answer for me was really simple. I don't have the team to do that right now. We don't have the time. Um, we thought of some quick and nimble ways of hopping on and having some level of impact, but time, the time it would take to do that for the return, I knew was not going to give us anything. So we just kind of secure a handle and then let it, let it be. And we're still not on TikTok. TikTok. The one that I felt very strongly about was Pinterest. I, I was frankly shocked we were not on Pinterest. Um, so all we did was set ourselves up uh, with a verified account. And we've been working with the Pinterest team just to see what organic um, traffic looks like. If we have anything that, like, that could be interesting that might actually be uh, somehow involved, like shape the way in which we'll look at paid in the future as opposed to you know, traditional social paid programs, maybe Pinterest would be a place that we should be testing and learning a bit more because anyone who's on Pinterest loves decor and fashion for sure. And a brand like ours that has a pretty good amount of awareness should definitely be there. So that's the one new platform I decided for us to spend a little bit of time in. Um, we're not on Twitter. Um, Darcy, who's new to my team, has been very adamant about being more present on Facebook. And that's actually been really interesting for us. And this is still very new. So like, like Pinterest, sprinkled with a bit of Facebook, but very much Instagram. I'd right. say that's what we're doing. Um, because we're a small team and we just got to make sure we're doing something that's really working for us as much as possible. And six months down the road, I might say, you know what? Instagram is not working. <laughs> we got to do something else. I'd be surprised. But let's, you know, nothing's forever. So we'll see. Let, let's actually talk a little bit about wh where you see, you know, you said that maybe in six months, Instagram might not be, what, what trends do you see for your team, for Makaj, for social media in general? Wh where do you see, uh, you know, the next six months or, or the next year? Um, so the trends I'm seeing, they are not, they're, well, what I see versus what I think we're going to do. <laughs> um, I've been, uh, this isn't a trend, but I'd be very interesting to, interested to see what Snapchat has been doing recently. Like they've um, clearly they're leaning into fashion in a really cool way. I saw some executions with Nike most recently with Ralph Lauren this week. I, I find them to be trying to get back into the, and it's not meant to be in the fence. I think it's very cool. Like they're really trying to um, get back into the game in, in a smart way. Um, so that's a new platform that I find to be very interesting. Instagram for me, um, we were talking about it this morning, my team and I of how to leverage reels. And I know everyone's not either on or off that train. I get that, but at least testing how it could work for your brand. Um, and there's Amy. <laughs> Can you tell I shared my link? Um, <laughs> <hi>. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, to me, reels is, um, is is going to be interesting um i see a lot of trends specifically for influencer marketing i know we've been talking a lot about it i think that's going to go into this collaboration world i think um a lot of people are sick of collaborations uh they say that there's still a world for them but i do think that this idea of slapping brand and brand or person and brand needs to evolve and that's where i think um, hopefully over time you'll see less, but more meaningful ones. Um, can you speak a little bit more about influencer marketing? Um, like what, what is that trend for you? Where do you think that's going to change and kind of shape up? So I will make a bold statement. I don't, I don't see us, um, paying for influencer marketing for quite some time. Uh, I have a strong opinion about those things. Um, to me, it's about nurturing relationships. And uh, if Iran and Elisa were on right now, they would be right behind me on that. Um, now, you still need to build relationships with people who connect with your product. We're an outerwear brand. We are Canadian. Um, more than ever right now, people will be outdoors this winter, um, connecting with their community and their family and their loved ones. So there's a world where we obviously are working with tastemakers and I love the term that the Chinese, you, I don't, I've worked in China a lot, they use KOLs, key opinion leaders. Like it, it feels a lot mess, less messy than an influencer because I think influencer for as a word now is um, a little off, but 
I believe in influencer marketing. I believe in the power of influence. I definitely believe in the power of micro communities more than ever. So that's been a win is looking at people not for the amount of followers they have, but truly who's, who's following them. Yeah, I'm not talking about a verified who's following them, but who is following, where are they from? What are these people, what are they posting? What are, you, what are they saving? These are the things that matter, not so much the amount of um, people that follow them. I, I was obviously at Reebok for a long time, which is owned by um, Adidas, Adidas. And my team was, uh, so I was on the newsroom team. So that's, um, that was digital content, social and PR. So that's what I was managing. And the uh, Adi team presented something that I thought was like mind blowing at the time. This is about two years ago. And I might be saying something that everyone already knows, but the sub 2 million influencer had value for sportswear brands. The two to 12, none, no value. That is a huge amount of money. And granted, we're talking about American influencers where that number, like there's a lot more of um, prevalent influencers with that kind of number, but um, don't waste your time in that world because the conversion, the impact, the connection you have to that community doesn't really have a return on investment. Then you get into the high bracket. So like the Cardi B's of this world, that's where you'll see another amount of return, depending on every deal, of course. But if you're just purely looking at numbers of engagement at the time, this is again, a little dated because it was two years ago, but you would, you'd be able to um, see bigger return. Now I look at sub 100 and I look at sub 50,000 um, all the time. And my team's looking at content creators. So it's not just someone who is going to put on the code and take some street style photo. It's them looking at your product and creating really beautiful content that your community will identify with that I will want to put on our social platform through the lens of somebody else that happens to love fashion and is seeing our brand in a different way, but we want to show that off. And a lot of these content creators have like a thousand followers, <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter that they have a really a keen eye and they're speaking to the right people. So, yeah. yeah I love that. Um, it's, it's, it's fascinating when you see, you know, all the UGC and how it's been able to help elevate brands. And especially right. nowadays when we might not have all of the studios at our beck and call to go in and shoot all the products, uh, right. to be able to really lean on that. Is there anything you'd like to share around, you know, your UGC strategy, Amakash? So, yeah. Um, I don't know how many people know this brand called Pangaea. And Gia's maybe how some people would pronounce it. It made its way around our team in a big way and really lit a fire under our behinds on the UGC front. It was really something that inspired us a lot. Um, so UGC is very important to us now. The challenge is, is that we've never really had an overt call to action or a community to share how they're styling our brand. So the second we started wanting to lean into UGC, we were behind the eight ball. Well, also, by the way, we didn't have seating samples at the time if we wanted to get things out to people because of product delays because of COVID. So um, we, we've now, we're slowly finding our footing. Um, we have a nice drumbeat of uh, people who definitely reach out and want to be a part of our of our network and want product because they really love it. And it's not a one for one. It's not a, we give you this, you need to send us a picture. In fact, we've now gone into the ether of um, Instagram and have found an absurd amount of UGC that we didn't even know existed because they didn't hashtag my cash or tag us, but it's out there. And we're going to want to show it more and more and more. Um, and uh, I think there's also a little more flexibility in our marketing calendar to not just say, so this week we're pushing X product. We need UGC of X product. It's let's just get some really beautiful content out there that our community shared with us that inspires us. And that's what we'll continuously do. So more and more as we're really filling our feed on a daily basis, we'll have more and more UGC as we go along, but it takes time. It takes time to like 
to start doing properly. Hangaya to me, like, I don't know what the heck was going on behind that curtain of <laughs> the Wizard of Oz situation, but I wish, <laughs> I so wish I could do that. Yeah, they did an excellent job. I know we're kind of running running uh, into the clock now. Tawny, do you have any, um, any, any further questions? I don't want to take up everybody's time with my own. Um, we have a couple of audience questions. We have one here from Allison, and she asks, what is your strong opinion about not paying influencers? Um, okay, let me, let me clarify that. The world of paying the same person over and over again to post, for example, um, is something that I wouldn't do. I think there's definitely a world where you're paying influencers because First of all, it's a it's a business, and it, I understand that a lot of people's uh, professions are that, and they matter and they care a lot. So, I'm not saying it's a hard no at all. I think the the aversion I have is that comment I made earlier about just it, it feeling a bit like a transaction. I pay you X, wear this coat, send me a picture. Mm -hmm. um, that's for me as a professional. I'm not even speaking on behalf of my cash. Um, so that might be a pushback that I get by the way, but for me right now in, in what we've gone through and what I done and where we are now today on December 20th, that's how I feel, but we all know that these things shift. Um, I think it's just the transactional piece that I just have a, a discomfort with. I think it also just boils down to you know, the, this whole, the thesis or, or what you've been able to do at Macash and, and the pivoting is, you know, if it's not authentic, um, it, it, it just, it's at the, it has to be the bedrock yeah. of, of these relationships. We need to, I, I'm sure everyone feels this way. We need to find a different word for authenticity because the hope yeah. is that everyone is, not everyone is, but you kind of hope that, you know, your brand and the, the, pro, the product or the, whatever you are, um, the message you're putting out there means something. I'm hoping. Yeah. But um, it is that though, Ambera, it, it really is that. It's, uh, you know, it happened this morning. I got an email from someone and it was like, I was in your store, I really like it. Can I get a free coat? I'll send you a picture. It was actually someone pretty famous and I was going back and forth with someone on it and I thought, oh, that's what I don't love anymore. Like, and again, right happens all the time luxury brands it happens all the time um and i get it i totally get it because i'm influenced by that person by the way who wears that coat that way I've, I've shopped on instagram plenty um i just personally right now i think just having gone through what we're going through in this pandemic and really feeling like we can connect um matters and then just leaning into other functions for conversion but who knows <laughs> who knows i have similar feelings so I'm, I'm with, with you with that, Michelle, for sure. Um, I think we have time for one more question. And for this one, we ask, I think there's a distinction between influencer and creator. I love working with creators because you get incredible content creation, but also can leverage the reach and unique audience of that individual. That is more of a comment. Sorry, I just found it in our chat. Let's read no Q&A. But great comment there, Michelle. I agree. Um, okay, so we also, so this is the final question, I should say. Um, as a, about a 1,000 follower content creator, what's the best way to be noticed by a brand you'd like to, be, like to work with? Oh, DM us. We, there's not a DM that's not unanswered on my team. DM us. And I would say, like, there's not always, it might not be at that time that we work together, but to the hopefully everyone's heard that I'm all about relationships. So we will save you and who knows further down the road if something pops up, but yeah, send us a message, please. Perfect, amazing. Well, thank you so much. I think that's about time. It's uh, 12.50. So thank you so much to Ambre and Michelle for joining us today. It's been quite enlightening and I think it's a really nice note to end the week on. Um, all this talk about authenticity and community. It's been absolutely lovely. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in, who's been supporting Social Media Week over the years and this week, and even just today, it's been really nice to connect with everyone. Even though it's virtual and not in real life, um, it's still been quite magical. 
And to anybody who is curious, we will be sharing all of the videos from our sessions that happened over the course of the week and today. If you haven't already, be sure to go to our website and sign up for our newsletter, as that's where we'll be sending all the links so that you can watch all this incredible content um, from this past week. And it's a little sad to say that social media week's over, but it's over. And um, happy Fridays to everybody and have a lovely weekend. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.